Hi, everybody. Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. We just have an absolute lit episode today. I don't know how else to say it. Um, this episode for me it just evaporated. It's an hour and it was over the second it started. I could not get enough. I could not listen enough. I wanted it to keep going. I had a million other questions. This is such a profound conversation. I think I'm so energized because I am not been a part of this conversation at length. This is to me, at least in my perspective, something that's new in the zeitgeist. And it's so familiar and relevant and powerful. I I just, I just, I, okay. All right. Let me back up. We're in a series right now called for the love of being seen and heard. So if you've been listening, like we're just paying attention to voices or communities or experiences or stories that are not being centered as they should be more or less. In my almost 50 years on this planet, there's been a lot of change, right? My mom's age group has seen even more change. But, you know, like you guys, 60 years ago, in tons of places in America, women couldn't even get a loan without their husband's signatures, right? And higher education was mostly men. And health concerns of women were grossly under-resourced and under-researched. Entertainment was created essentially by men for men. Um, And and then if you add, like I could and would, a layer of sort of religious structures on top of that, there's even more categories about the primacy of men in the world. And I can tell you, like with my own journey, I – I did the I did the thing that I felt like was prescribed. Um, even in the '90s, I got married really early, started having babies just right out of the gate. I had three kids in my 20s. Um, I mean, I was 27 with three kids, and then I did it. I I raised them. I did the cooking. I did all the preschool stuff. I did all the all the things, like all the billion things that it's like. Um, and then I added back on a full time career. And fortunately for me, I, I had enough scaffolding around me to be able to grow into my own career um, all the way to where it is today. But there was still, I can't not kill you how many times I would just sit in my car and cry and just thought, I just can't do it. I just can't do all this. I cannot do all this. There isn't one second of the day where I am not actively meeting people's needs, anticipating what's next, planning for the future, handling this family and home labor in addition to everything else. And so you guys, I'm just telling you, I am so happy you're listening today. Don't let this episode get interrupted. I have Eve Rodsky on today. So Eve is a, she's a Harvard law school grad, years of training in organizational, organizational management experience. Okay. And so she started wondering what would it be like if couples could reimagine their relationships as to how it relates to rebalancing the work it takes to run a home. So we're going to put our full-time jobs like over here on the side. There's this whole home load that is just enormous. And so in her first book, which is called Fair Play, which we talk about today, she created this national conversation about greater equality on the home front with a system she made up from tons and tons and tons of research that literally helps couples balance the domestic workload. Um, Of course, understanding that women were doing what she calls almost all of the invisible labor to at least two thirds in general on average, in addition to having a job outside the home. So, or a job period. And so Eve realized that once something of something like balance was achieved, um, 
and this is going to be a part two conversation, which you'll hear us say, we couldn't even get to this. There was so much to talk about, but then that creates time to focus on a handful of other things that really matter to us that are outside work, home and family. And so that's going to have to be part two um, of this podcast. And that book was called find your unicorn space. So you guys, I was just leaning forward during this entire conversation when she talked about what it was like to try to do it all. So mamas, wives, domestic partners, I'll tell you right now, Eve sees you and she hears you um, as this series suggests. And she is out there actively helping to change the dynamic for you. Um, There was this moment and Eve talks about it in our interview in the video promoting fair play where she is stressed out. She's pet her breast pump and diaper bag are in the front car seat. She's leaving her full-time job with her, her fancy degree. She's credentialed. There's a, she's picking up a kid from preschool. She's got a contract, a work contract, like also like on the floor that needs her immediate attention. And she gets a text from her husband about the blueberries that she forgot. I'm going to not say anymore because she tells the whole story um, as that being a tipping point. You are going to feel so understood and seen. I, I just, I don't even know. I'm so glad you're here. This is going to be an episode you're going to want to share. You're going to want to share this definitely with your friends and your sisters, but mamas, you're going to want to share this with your daughters. God, I wish somebody would have said this to me when I was young and moving into young adulthood. I wish I could have even known that there was a better, stronger, fairer, more true narrative out there than the one I just hooked into and followed to the best of my ability until it just left me so empty and depleted. I'd have to sit in the driveway and just cry. So, woo, we got a hot one today, you guys. Um, Eve has tons of actionable solutions A lot of this is free and online, and I'm going to give you the link at the end. Um, And this is the legacy we both deserve and want to pass on. Welcome, the bright and brilliant Eve Rodsky to the show. Eve, I am just really, I'm so glad that you're here today. I just was telling you before we started, I've been so looking forward to this conversation and I could not be more thrilled that this exact discussion is is finding its way into the zeitgeist. It's about damn time. Thank you, Jen. I really appreciate it. And I was telling you that uh, I didn't get to go to mom 2.0 this year, but everybody who went said you were the absolute highlight of the conference. So thank you for (laughs) sharing yourself with the world too. So ridiculous. What is work? What is this life? (laughs) Thank you for that. So, okay, Eve, I've told my listeners a little bit about you. So, and your work, kind of the high stuff. Um, But I wonder if you can talk about, I guess, the moment really that it hit home for you that still in this year of our Lord 2023, there is still a really big, like a profoundly large imbalance between couples in managing things with like family and home. So I, I, you were raised by a single mom. Um, so that's a whole conversation. And so I imagine what was modeled to you probably looked pretty different than what you got once you became a person who was married and started having kids. And so for you, what was the like, moment that began the path of taking your phenomenal expertise. You are like, you're a, you're a multi hyphen Mm -hmm. in family mediation and strategy and organizational management. Like literally you're the girl for this job. (laughs) Your, your credentials made you like positioned you to center this conversation. Um, but what was this a slow burn for you? Was it a moment Um, how did all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, this doesn't feel fair. Well, um, Jen, what I'll tell you, and I think this is important for your listeners to understand is that I did not set out 
even though you gave me such a beautiful introduction, to be an expert on the gender division of labor. Sure. That was not what was on my third grade. What do you want to be on the board? Totally. You know, I'm resolutely Gen X. I mean, <laughs> I was told by my third grade teacher I could be anything, right? So sure, I'm course. sure it said astronaut, right? Um, <laughs> but, and it definitely wasn't yeah. what I was thinking about in um, 2000 when I entered Harvard Law School. Elizabeth Warren was actually our orientation teacher. And she asked us, what do we want to do with our law degree? And what was so interesting is that I don't remember any women saying that they wanted to help other women or gender studies was a big deal. Our mantra back then, or our motivation back then was just to be as good as men. And so the idea was just to fit into male spaces. Yeah. And so I did that. I started off in um, mergers and acquisitions. I ended up working, as you said, for families that look like the HBO show Succession. Sure. And your listeners should feel bad for me um, yeah. if you've watched that show. But what I do for those families is I was I started to work with them as their lawyer to use governance and organizational management systems to create, you know, grace and humor and generosity around their most difficult organizational decisions and for family businesses and family foundations, those conversations are really hard. Yeah. And so that was the work that I was doing when uh, my life sort of fell apart after my second son came Hmm. because I was working. I I wasn't what I thought I was going to be. I really probably told Elizabeth Warren then not an astronaut. By then I said I was going to be president of the United States. Sure. And a senator from New York and a Nick City dancer. So yeah. um, I was none of those things. Right. But but I think the hard part for me was that I did think I would be smashing, you know, these glass ceilings, Jen. Yeah. But really, I mean, if you want me to be honest, the only thing I can tell you I was smashing, you know, sort of 10 years later after law school was like peas for my toddler, Zach, um, you know, while breastfeeding a baby, Ben, negotiating a return to work from maternity leave, um, where the organization I was working for basically said, if I wanted to come back, I would have to lose my direct reports. And also I would have to pump in a, um, a a modified broom closet and I'd have to bring my own battery pack because there was no outlets in that closet. And so there was sort of this humiliating abandonment of my work identity, of who I set out to be all these years of of really trying um, to make it in the workplace were sort of, you know, being evaporated. But at the same time, after my second son was born, my husband, Seth, decides to send me a text that says, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. And that was the moment you asked for that moment. Yeah. But I want to give you the context for that yeah, moment. Yeah, give it. Obviously, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries can sound like an innocuous request. But that day that I got that text, um, I pulled over to the side of the road. I started to sob. Yeah. You can sort of picture my car. I had a breast pump. Totally. uh, In the the passenger seat of my car. I had uh, gifts for newborn baby to return in the backseat of my car. I had my toddler's snack in the car because I was picking him up from his toddler transition program. And so all of this like overwhelm was swirling against me. Also hitting the fact that I wasn't going back to work in the same place um, because my, like as I said, my job was sort of abandoning me. And then my husband, who's supposed to be my biggest support, basically is adding this burden, this idea that I'm the fulfiller of his smoothie needs, right? On top of everything else. And Jen, honestly, that was it. I I couldn't make it. I just broke down. And, you know, in L.A., we don't pull over lightly because there's a lot of traffic here. No doubt. The fact that I was on the side of the road, just absolutely sobbing, thinking that my marriage was going to be ending over off-season blueberries. Uh It was very, um, it was sort of eye-opening, but also highly isolating. Mm -hmm. Um, And that swirl, and I'll tell you one more thing. One more thing I needed to let you know was Mm -hmm. that around the same time, because we don't have free childcare in this country. We don't have, you know, federal um, paid leave. It's very hard for women, especially for working families, for dual income earners. And so I remember at that time, everyone said to me, you know, hang in there, Eve, once your kids get into school, everything's going to get easier. And so I remember believing that, that, that once my kids were in school, somehow I get my day back. Mm. But I remember going to the school for the first time around this so this swirling time when my husband was abandoning me, my work was abandoning me. 
And I get there to this toddler program that I was telling you about with my son, Zach. And I was so excited because I'm like, we're in school. Everything's going to change. And the preschool teacher echoed that. She said, you know, look around. These people here, while we were playing sort of like patty cake with our kids in a circle, these people around here are going to be your best friends. They're going to help you. And then, Jen, I look at my name tag and it said Zach's mom. Mm, Yeah. And so I think it was that combination of Mm. overwhelm and erasure of my identity that really pushed me to the breaking point. Oh, God. It's so familiar that I could scream. I could just scream. Um, Nobody was really having this conversation about invisible unpaid family and home labor when I, because I'm ahead of you. I've got five kids. Yes. um, And so now they're like 17 to 25. Mm -hmm. But when they were preschool, first, third grade, all, I did this. Jen, I just got chills because you were the worst. You had it the worst because you were the demographic right before me that was Mm -hmm. told you could do anything and be anything. We're both, I guess, resolutely Gen X, but you had nobody to tell you that it was anything other than your responsibility or your fault if things went wrong. This is a brand new idea to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And like as much as I want to be like, damn all these men who just coast along and, and think their life shouldn't change. Nor did I challenge yes, the system. Right, I was like, I'm the, I, I, my husband couldn't, I'm divorced now, but he couldn't name anybody's teacher. Mm-hmm. Elementary <laughs> school is like a second yes. job. It totally. is a second job. I mean, the day my last kid finished fifth grade, I was like, Holy <laughs> Lord, thank you, thank God, God, we made it through elementary school. <laughs> but I mean, that's not true. And the amount of labor that I did by myself um, for the kids in the home, too. Um, was, no, it sounds like you were with the, one of the new terms on TikTok I'm seeing, and I put it in fair play when I first wrote the book, because it was early coined by a woman. A uh, psychologist was like a single married woman. There, there are yeah. a lot of us out there who, mm. and, and again, I think that day of the blueberries text, Jen, yeah. was a single married woman day where I almost felt like, should I have just done it the way my mother did it? Yeah. So I, like I vowed I yeah. was going to have an equal partner, right? In life. Yeah. And my father left my mother when my mom, when she was pregnant with my brother, we never knew that he was disabled until um, seventh grade when I realized he couldn't read. I mean, look, it wasn't wow. easy. I wouldn't say that being a single parent is easy. It is yeah. profoundly hard. And I see you out there. Uh-huh. Um, but I will say that some of the expectations I had living with my partner were so different from the reality that that pain, Jen, yeah. I'm not sure that that's, I'm not saying I'm not at all, you know, comparing it to my mother's experience, yeah. but that pain and the yeah. expectation versus reality was, was real. Yeah. And for people out there who are partnered and yes, people are telling you, you should feel lucky you have a partner and they don't abuse you, please God. And they're, you know, good men out there. Of course they are. Yeah. Seth is a good man. Right. And in fact, you know, we're still married and things are very different now. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about that. But I will say that as, even though Fair Play started off as a love letter to women, it actually became a love letter to men, Jen. Hmm. Because there are a lot of societal expectations also on men for That's how true. they have to be. Yep. What their roles should be that when they start challenging that status quo, um, they get a lot of pushback from society. No too. doubt. Yeah. No doubt. You are so right. Like this actually um, affects all of us for worse. And so <laughs> yes, for worse. let's Eve, take us back earlier because um, obviously this is, we can all intuit from mm-hmm. history. This is a historical structure. I mean, this is patriarchal. Um, This goes, this is centuries old, some of this. And so um, that informs why this is still ongoing. But what can you tell us? Because of course, now you've really drilled in here. What can you tell us from the research? Why haven't we got naturally better about sharing the load here when so many other categories for women have become elevated and not equal yet, but closer. Um, right, closer. We're, we're bridging gaps everywhere. Why is this one still such a breach? 
It's our last big frontier for women. It is a huge breach. And I honestly believe, Jen, that this is literally the we changing and inviting men into their full power in the home is the only way women are going to be able to step out into their full power in the world. And you're out there and you inspire women to be in their full power in the world. And so our messages are very adjacent, mm. inviting men. And again, this is, doesn't matter if you're married to a man. It doesn't matter if you're a single parent. It doesn't matter if you're in a, um, a gay family. Mm -hmm. This is, this applies to all of us and I'll explain yeah. why. So on the systemic level, like we said, you know, we don't have supports, but I'll explain what happened when right after I had the blueberries breakdown, um, I'm a, again, resolutely Gen X, Harvard trained, uh, type A. So I went to the libraries, right? I decided to start thinking about what was, was happening to me, mm. especially because I write about in fair play that this wasn't just a me problem. I, that day was the day that I broke down, mm. but then I start to look around me and then I would be like, oh my God. Jen's having this issue. Yeah. Um, I went on a breast cancer march. I write about being with 10 women and having the best morning on a Saturday. And these women were the head of stroke and trauma at a big hospital and a award-winning producer, women that I respected and knew that they could use their voice even better than me. Mm. And then noon comes. And I remember looking at everybody's phone and it was the same. It was men texting us when are you coming home from the parade? Yeah. You've been gone for four hours. Do you expect me to do this, you know, alone all day? Um, where is Hudson's soccer bag? Yeah. What's the address of the birthday party? My yeah. friend Kate's favorite, my friend Kate's husband's text was my favorite. It just said, do the kids need to eat lunch? <laughs> and I said, what is happening? And so yeah. I remember that day. Mm. These women, these strong women did not stand up and say, oh, this is bull. We're going to lunch together. They all looked at me with resoundly painful faces and said, Eve, I'm sorry, we can't go to lunch. I left my partner with too much to do. Gosh. And they went to bring the perfectly wrapped gift to the birthday party and find Hudson soccer bag. And as Kate did, feed her kids lunch. But that day I decided to count up how many phone calls and texts we had received before the, my, my friends left. We had 30 phone calls and 46 texts for 10 women over 30 minutes. Wow. And so that's when I knew that there was something bigger here. I didn't know if this was our generation's Gosh. phenomenon or if it was past. But what I found out was that um, this thing has a name. You and I never heard of it. We just did it. You know, our generation did not hear of this. Um, maybe some people in gender studies did, but we were told we had opportunities. Our parents did it. We should feel grateful. Um, and so this idea of a second shift that women, you know, do 80 more hours of, of housework and childcare after their paid work a week, um, that there's something called emotional labor, uh, the mental load, yeah. um, or as one woman, uh, who I love when I interviewed her, she called it, she said, you know, fair play taught me, I don't have a magical vagina that whispers to me at night what my husband's uh, mother wants for Christmas, right? So that, that's that's sort of this emotional yeah. labor, right? That yeah. we somehow are expected to get those birthday cards and plan yeah. the birth, you know, the parties yeah. and the thank you notes and the trips and um and so and the you know silly hair day for school. Um, that's emotional totally. labor. The mental load um, was another term I'd heard, but I will tell you my favorite term if you want to talk about generational here was a term uh, from an, a sociologist from 1986, Jen, 1986. Mm. She argued, she called what were this phenomena we're talking about invisible work. Yeah. Because what she argued was that we can never make it visible. That all the work that we, if we made it visible, um, society would collapse. So we have to instead convince women, and this is my in my terms now, but she had a version of this saying, uh, we have to convince women that it's their responsibility. I like to say we've convinced women that their time is sand. It's infinite. Whereas we guard men's time as if it's finite, like diamonds, mm -hmm. not individual men's fault, but they've been taught to protect their time. Mm -hmm. So during this time, when I heard that invisible work term, not only did I set out to make the invisible visible, where I started a spreadsheet, I met women like you all over the country and it finally started to break my depression because mm. I knew I wasn't alone. Remember, this is before iPads and women yeah, like you yeah. I could find you. I had to go through early Facebook and friends of friends. It's called the snowball research effect and talking to women about what they did that was invisible to their partners, 
Mm -hmm. um, and their children was highly cathartic. Um, but also understanding that this will never change unless we understand one important thing. We've become complicit in our own oppression. That's right. Because since birth, we've been taught that our time is, is worthless. Like if, yeah. if you don't believe me, just watch what happens when women enter male professions, salaries automatically come down. Awesome. You can still look at health systems and they say breastfeeding is free. Yes. When it's 1800 hours a year mm -hmm. um, and then we get conditioned to believe. And again, in religious systems, I'm from a religious a Jewish background, like we're talked about as like the helpers. Certainly. And again, and men are like the priests, right? You're there to sort of uh, support men, right? There's this conditioning that you can do everything be to, to protect the time of men. Yep. And so then what happens to us is we start saying things like I did with Seth, things like, well, in the time it takes me to tell Seth what to do, I should do it myself. I've said that. And then I also said, um, I'm a better multitasker, Jen, which is yeah. re resoundingly not true. Sure. Uh, and then I said to myself, yeah, well, he makes more money than me. Mm. So I should do more in the home, even mm. though I would argue my job is way more important. I have more yeah. education. Yeah. I'm trying to work on uh, important governance systems. and Of course. So all and these the time things, is the uh, same. And, and our time, time still is working full time, full so. time, but I didn't see it that way. I saw it as, yeah. as I was worthless. My time was worthless. My time was infinite. This one woman really hit it home for me because she said her and her partner were both colorectal surgeons, Jen, but that she, her husband was better at focusing on one task at a time and she could find the time. Yeah. We're not as Albert if, Einstein. As if, right? That's you can't a real find thing. time. That's right. You cannot find time. So that's it. That for me was the, 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 the sort of when the matrix, when you take like the red pill or whatever, when you're yes. like, want to see what the real reality is, I realized that I could create a system and I did. And we'll talk about that. Yeah. But that until we could also be a movement together out there to convince women that our time is diamonds, mm -hmm. that we deserve choice over how we use our day, mm -hmm. that we can be something other than a parent and a partner and a professional that, that if I want to be an amateur acrobat, like that, that is actually worthy of, of, of pursuit, even like vanquishing guilt and shame um, to do that is so hard. Uh, convincing schools not to call women first, even when we put our husbands as the number one contact, mm. it's just, it's a whole movement that we all have mm. to work on. We have to work on together to convince women that their time is diamonds. And so I want to just say one more thing. If you've ever said to yourself, I'm a better multitasker, I'm wired differently for care. Yes. And the time it takes me to tell him or her, they what to do, I should do it myself. Uh, my partner makes more money than me, so I should do it all. I'm here to tell you, we've all said those things. Mm. But but it, it's not true. None of them yeah. are true. You're not, as one neuroscientist said to me, you're not a better multitasker. Nobody is good at multitasking. We've just convinced women that they're better at wiping asses and doing dishes to pave the way for men's free time, their tenure, their promotions. Uh, and and we, we can no longer do that. So my For the Love podcast, which you are listening to right now, obviously, has always been about sharing inspiring and thought-provoking and empowering and entertaining conversations with honestly some of the best people on earth. It is such a joy and passion for me. That's why I've also, you guys, been so delighted, beyond delighted, to be guest hosting the Make Me Care About podcast. So in that podcast, we've brought awareness and attention to absolutely life-changing work from superstars in their respective fields, revealing the importance of some really unexpected things like garbanzo beans and ninth grade, like if you know, you know. But my latest Make Me Care About episode is one for the books because I chatted with Melinda Gates, the Melinda Gates, and you're not going to want to miss our conversation. We talk about why it's so important to care about these deeply impactful topics that don't get much airtime or attention. And specifically how the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is addressing inequities, specifically around women's power and health, my, you know, huge pillar, through 
innovative solutions that are helping really the entire world live and grow and thrive. It's just so exciting. It really is. You'll walk away knowing more and caring more in all the best ways. And you may end up feeling a little bit more hopeful too. And I think you will. So you guys listen in and subscribe to my episode with Melinda, as well as all the Make Me Care About episodes, wherever you get your podcasts. A fun thing for me that I've told you about before is that my 3 a.m. nighttime brain wants to wake up and think about, well, like health insurance premiums that are due and my children's future and the state of all of our cars and what I said that one time to that one person. But also a fun thing for me now is that 3 a.m. brain is no longer invited to the party because of one thing, focal CBD sleep gummies. They have changed my sleep game entirely. First of all, they work in that they have solved my middle of the night problems, but they're also yummy, like healthy sleep candy. I don't know what kind of magic makes them so effective because I'm not a scientist, but there's no weirdness in these. There's nothing bad. It's only good stuff only, okay? So maybe you are a champion sleeper. If so, congratulations. And you just need a little focus during the day. Guess what? Focal has daytime gummies too. So I've got a code for you. If you want to change your brain game, for the love is your code to get 20% off at focal.com. But really, sleep is priceless. So you can thank me later. So that's focal, F-O-C-L dot com. And your code is for the love for 20% off. I'm serious. I could sit here and listen to you talk about this all day long. I am. It's so funny to listen to you sort of go through it because I know this. I am a feminist. I lead women. (laughs) I have a big company. I, I know this. And even listening to you say it, I feel my internal Mm -hmm. ticker just click up like, Mm-hmm. All that programming is really, really hard to reverse. It's it's really baked in. And we have been told this. And then, of course, we saw it by example for a lot of most of our moms, most of our generation. That's the way it went. And so I can feel my own internal resistance. Like, yes, yes. I know you're right. It, this is this is a big deal. And it requires so much just intention and conversation around it, which is why I'm so delighted that you are out here leading. Let's talk about the system you created. Okay. So, all right, (laughs) let's go back. So you're, you are coming to the realization that this is a pain point for virtually all of us, which you are so right in some weird way. That's comforting. It was comforting. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not doing a bad (laughs) job. Right. Exactly. You're asked to do the job of a a person in three quarters. Correct. So um, that alone, um, takes some of the gaslighting out of the conversation. Um, and yes. so, so you're there, you're like, this is real. This is happening. This is happening at multiple levels of income and geography and family dynamics. And it, it, this is, this is very broad. So then you decide what? what am I going to do here? What, how am I going to move forward? And then I want to move. I, I'm very interested in hearing you talk through sort of the system that you developed because it's profound. Thank you. Um, what did I do? Well, uh, once I knew that this term invisible work existed, I became obsessed And again, I had no idea this would turn into a book. I had no idea that this would turn into a card deck. I had no idea that this would do anything. I was just trying as a sociologist, as an anthropologist, um, as an economist, those are all my, the, my training points, um, that I wanted to really understand because there was a question that kept nagging on me as an economist, that's my training. Um, why would it be that, um, in our gross domestic product, Mm -hmm. if I hired a housekeeper, that that transaction would be recorded as productivity, if I marry my housekeeper, that she and she does the same thing in the home, that is not recorded as productivity anymore. Who does that benefit when we erase single parents, when we erase stay-at-home mothers? Who is that benefiting? So I became sort of obsessed with that question. 
And so, like I said, making the invisible visible felt to me like the first place to start because there's a management expert that people love in my world named Peter Drucker. And one of his favorite phrases or my favorite phrase of his is you can't manage what you can't measure. Hmm. So I went to, I decided that nobody had measured and I went to the libraries. I looked on early Amazon for yeah. organization for the home. I just got like bins. I didn't see anything I was looking for. So I decided to start writing on index cards. Um, after I had this giant spreadsheet, like I told you, I started, I opened an Excel sheet and then corresponding index cards. And I wrote down um, on the index cards that corresponded to the tabs of the Excel sheet every single thing women told me. And I started to organize it into this giant spreadsheet. It was going to go to Seth because at that point I thought lists alone could work, which I found found that we've been making lists for a hundred years and lists alone do not work. That's right. But at that time I thought making the spreadsheet would be the end of it. Mm -hmm. I will say to you, as I said earlier, making the spreadsheet of invisible work, especially at a time when there was no TikTok, there was no Instagram. This was 2011. We just got iPads, I think. Um, felt profoundly uh, important because I found women like you across the country through friends of friends of friends, ultimately mirroring the U.S. census. And I felt like, wow, okay, I'm not alone. And it got so granular to the point where I would get calls from like a woman from the Jewish Federation of Arizona. And she'd say things to me like, I see under your medical and healthy living tab, (laughs) tab 68 on Excel, Eve, that you put the application of sunscreen. (laughs) <laughs> but you added it for two minutes only. You oh, have I, to put in the 30 minutes for the chase and the whining. I was oh, like, oh my gosh. God, I forgot the 30 God, minutes for the chase. Right. And the, so it was that. My ass. She's yeah. like, what? Ha-? She's like, under your tab. And then another woman would be like, uh-huh. under your tab for extracurricular non sports. Yeah. I don't see Girl Scout cookies ordering in sales. So it was like that. It was that, that granular. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. finally I get this 98 tab spreadsheet, 2000 items of invisible work. I send it to oh Seth gosh. with literally the opposite of my training as a communicator and a lawyer. Sure. Just no, no context. Just yes, can't wait like, to discuss. Presented without comment. No yes. comment. Just like, ta-da. And he got, he gave me back one of the early pixelated, like, mm see no evil monkey emoji situations. And that was a very profound step towards the system because at that point, when I realized that Seth had a see no evil to this giant spreadsheet, I realized that lists were not going to help me. And so I had a couple of things I could do at this point. I could just continue to have this beautiful group of women that I complained to and let my life stay the same. Mm -hmm. And stay married, which would have been better, I still thought, than being a single parent, which my mother was, like I said. And I still really did love Seth. Mm. Um, But I was going to become a great version of myself. Mm. Or or I could eat, pray, love the shit out of my marriage, which was, I think, a very big narrative around our time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Like, there was a privilege yeah. narrative for sure. Yeah, yeah, like where, sure. where, what's going to happen to my kids? You know, you had five, uh, you know, I had two yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, or, or, uh, which I finally did. There was a hair club for men ad in the eighties in New York that said, I'm not just the hair club for men president. I'm the first right. client. Yeah. That's what I did. I decided to become the first client. Mm. And so I beca- decided to take the training I'd been using for the HBO show succession families and yeah. postulate, mm-hmm. what if our homes were an organization? Yeah. What I if we started that. treating our homes mm-hmm. as an organization? And that's where it became a love letter to men because military men, men who are coaches, sure. they all understood this idea of knowing of your role, yeah. right? Because a lot of men were saying, I don't know my role in the home. And it's very psychologically unsafe. They didn't say it that mm-hmm. way, but they were saying, I don't know where to come in. Like I, my wife is better because I shall just redo whatever I do. Fair. So nothing was working for anybody. Yeah. So that's what I did. So the first thing I did was I took a whiteboard and I wrote three words, which I knew were the secret to successful organizations that I taught my clients. The secret to successful organizations are boundaries, hmm. systems, and communication. Great. That's it. Mm-hmm. It's much easier said than done, as Jen sure. and I just talked about, because of the boundaries issue. Mm. The, the trigger points we brought up so far for why this almost needs a trigger warning 
is because of the boundaries issues. Women breach our boundaries all the time, not because it's our fault, but because we were told we should not have boundaries, that availability is part of our identity. Correct. However, systems, Jen, super easy for me to create. So of course, that's where I started. Great. I couldn't really work on the boundary stuff because I was still being triggered by the boundaries issues. Uh -huh. Still working on that, you know, 10 years later. Sure. And communication at that point, as you saw, I was sending things to Seth with, yeah. with no, with no context. Yes. And I was so Please angry. Look at this 2000 piece it's, Excel it's, sheet. Exactly. Get back to me at your, at, get at back your to teacher. me at your convenience. Yes. <laughs> so communication wasn't working yeah. for me, but I knew I could lose myself in systems. Okay. And so that's where I began the fair play card game book, this sort of a movement is a system yeah. and what is, and people are afraid of that because they want their home to be full of love, but it is full of love because the three most toxic words that are antith antithetical to love are figure it out. Hmm. We're going to figure it out. If you ever say those words, that is a recipe for the anti-love for disaster. The, the, the way to foster love is to have as much time together when emotion is low and cognition is high. Yeah. And typically you can only be in those situations of emotion is low, cognition is high, either by shipping your kids off to boarding school, which I didn't yeah. have the resources at that yeah. time to do, or finding systems that work. Yeah. Yes. It's, um, it's this natural structure that comes in and takes some of the emotion out of it and the hyperbole out of it and the assumptions out of it. And, um, it brings it down to brass tacks, which I can see how this would even on the front end serve men. Um, it does. Where who go, it does. Oh, I like rules, rules, yes, yes. rules make sense to me. Like give me the thing. And that is kind of yeah. how they, you know, their brains often work. So talk more, talk more about, um, the development of the fair, the fair play cards, what they are, what they look like. Give us some examples. Yes. Um, okay. How does this work in real life? We'll have fun. I want to play a game with you too, if that's okay, okay Jen. Yes, let's do it. So the game, so the car, it's a card game. And the reason why it's a card game, um, you, and I would always recommend reading the book first because yes. all of this triggering, it becomes a scorekeeping exercise and it will make you collapse and cry if you uh -huh. just look at the cards without understanding the book and the context behind the rules of the, it's a game. It's not supposed to be a scorekeeping spreadsheet. So what happened was I wanted a conversation tool, as I said, boundary systems, communication. So I'll tell you about why it became cards first. That's the communication piece. Because when I was talking to patriarchs about their death plan, that's basically what succession is. That's a nice way to say, like, you're going to die. Who's going to take over? Right. I would go into these rooms of these billionaires, these multimillionaires, sit down with them as, you know, their lawyer, their family office had hired me as their lawyer. And a lot of the men especially would say to me things like, I'm not going to die. So I don't need you. Well, there's that, <laughs> there's that approach to so, uh, life. Exactly. So it became really hard. It was like, okay, do I leave? And, but mm -hmm. over time, I realized that having cards with me, card games, ways for these oh. men to articulate what their legacy looked like through pictures. Like, oh, your <gasps> legacy is a bicycle. Why is it a bicycle? Oh, oh you had a paper route. Oh, so yeah. Funny. Your first paper route was media, mm -hmm. you know. So, so that's sort of how I got people to talk. So I knew yeah. I wanted to do something that was a game because okay. games have helped me yeah. as a facilitator. But to get to what type of system I was going to enter people into through the game took obviously a lot of work, a lot of beta testing, five sure. years actually until I wrote it down. Yeah. But starting in 20, the end of 2011, 2012, I started to understand that the way to create a system would be to first write down what a system is. A system is just three things and they shouldn't scare anybody. Mm -hmm. They're explicitly defined expectations. They're, they're fairness and transparency and you know your role. Okay. Even my Aunt Marion's Mahjong group has this. You don't bring <laughs> exactly. snack twice to the group. That's right. You're out. <laughs> Clearly defined expectations. You know your yeah. role. You're a player. You show up on time, right? Yeah. There's fairness and transparency because there's Mahjong rules. Sure. The home has none of these. Yeah. Nobody said things were fair. Men were telling me that they don't know their role. Um, people were saying that they have no explicitly defined expectations. In fact, totally. one man said to me, they wait to decide who's taking the dog out every day. Oh, right when it's about to take a piss on the rug. Yeah. That decision fatigue, making the mm -hmm. same decision over and over again is mm -hmm. what is killing us. Yep. 
And so how do Mm. you get away from the piss on the rug, figure it out scenario? Well, this is a game where basically you take, there's a hundred cards in the game. And what you're going to do with the cards is you're going to hold a card and own it from start to finish. So how do we get there and know that that was the most important way to play this game? Well, I'll give you an example. I didn't understand how people, when I was in the spreadsheet mode, how people were dividing up labor. Mm-hmm. And Jen, that was because so many people would say to me, when, and I'll read you some of the cards, mm. uh, you know, who's in, who's in charge of bathing and grooming the kids? We both are. Who's mm. in charge of groceries? We both are. Okay. Uh-huh. Who's helping with medical, dental, and healthy living? We both are. Uh Who's taking care of the kids on school breaks? We both are. I'm like, oh my God, I can't get to any accurate data here. Uh Men over-report, women under-report. It was a Uh mess. Yeah. So finally, finally, I will ask the most important question I've ever asked in the past 10 years that led to the fair play system. And that was, how did mustard get in your refrigerator? Oh gosh. Uh once I found that question, oh gosh, because, and I liked it because you can ask it in 17 countries because everybody has a condiment, Jen, that they like. Yeah. This is what I heard from women who are partnered with men. They were the ones noticing their second son, Johnny, liked yeah. yellow mustard with his protein. That's right. That's the one they needed because otherwise he won't eat any protein. In the workplace, I knew that phase. We call that conception. You get paid big bucks to conceive of new ideas. As an entrepreneur, you're coming up with new ideas all the time. That's where the secret sauce is. So I wrote down conception. Hmm. And then women were also telling me they were getting stakeholder buy-in from the household for what people wanted on that grocery list. They didn't call it stakeholder buy-in, but that's what I was sitting for for planning. And then they were monitoring the mustard for when it ran low. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, that's the planning phase. Like we know that from organizational management. Mm -hmm. And then men were saying to me, this is why they both were doing groceries because they were the ones going to the store to pick up the mustard, but they're bringing home spicy Dijon and they, you know, yellow is what they were supposed to bring home. And so what happens was that women were then saying to me, Eve, you want me to trust my partner with my living will? The dude can't even bring home the right type of mustard. And then ding, ding, ding. That was it. I got my key insight. Mm. Homes were losing the two most important things organizations need accountability and trust. Wow. It wasn't about the blueberries in my, it was my own realization. It wasn't about the blueberries. It wasn't about the mustard. I had lost accountability and trust in Seth that he could do anything related to our home. And so once I had no accountability, he had no accountability. I, I, I lopped him out. So yeah. he did nothing anymore. And I lost complete trust in him to the yeah. point where I was saying things like Seth can't even take our kids to a doctor's appointment because he won't know what to say. Yeah. And so then he had no role in our family and totally. everything was spiraling downward. Just cycle. Yep. Cycle downward. And so once I understood accountability and trust could be restored mm-hmm. through ownership, the idea of holding the conception, planning and execution together is what we do in the workplace to revamp accountability and trust. We could do that in the home. Oh and gosh. that's it. You hold a card now. We said that I started with extracurricular sports for toddlers. It wasn't getting to the little league field. That was the execution. He now knew it was the C serving our kids friends for what they wanted to play and talking to the parents about which leagues are around yeah. the P mm-hmm. getting on a text chain with 80 other parents for who's yeah. going to help the kids get to practice. Um, figure out who's snack dad, who is getting a coach's gift. And then, of course, still showing up at the Little League field or the soccer field yeah. when it's time with the protective gear and sunscreen sure. and the water bottle. Yeah. Just Seth understanding that that was the CPE of extracurricular sports, mm-hmm. not just getting to the Little League field. I was starting to get six hours of my week back. Wow. And that was just one card of 100 wow. cards. And so I said, okay, great. It's never going to be 50-50, even though now it is 10 years later. But at that time, mm. there was no way in hell yeah. with, with our accountability and trust loss that I thought it was going to be 50-50, but at least he could take one card. And yeah. slowly, little by little, Jen, we started to restore in my own first client relationship, my own, we started to restore the trust through the system. And then we started to invite other people to play and more people to play and more people to play. And then I did early cards on index cards and I sent them out. And then I had a graphic designer print my own cards and we got more data. And eventually we wrote it. I wrote it into a book. Um, 
and then we now have it obviously published it out in the world. But that, so that you got the whole story, but that was it. It was that understanding that if you start with systems, even if you can't get there, this accountability and trust concept of ownership is very, very powerful. I have a million questions. Yes. I just, this is super fascinating. Um, I know almost nobody who does this. Almost. Uh, my brain's going through the roller. Nobody, of nobody does this. Nobody does I'm this. Like, I can think of a t- this many. No, zero. Really, zero. Yeah. And right. Jen, that's why it was so triggering for people because I'm telling them to do something different, even though it's not prescriptive. Why I think fair play ultimately took off mm. was I wasn't telling people how to live their lives. Yeah, yeah. I was telling people here is a tool. I see. To make your lives better. But again, it's a very different way that we've been taught and conditioned. And that's why, back to what I said to you earlier, it's not just systems. Mm. Secret formula for a healthy organization are boundaries, systems, and communication. And the reason probably why no one's doing that type of system, even though it makes sense, is because we've gotten so far away from having any form of healthy communication in our relationships We literally do not know how to communicate anymore. We don't practice it. We don't invest in it. We practice more in freaking meditation Mm. than we do practicing communication. And that's the biggest problem is it's a secret formula of three things. Mm. We have to practice the boundary systems communication. And almost nobody I knew at that time when I was writing this book had ever even thought of it that way. You guys, one thing I consistently get questions about has to do with parenting our LGBTQIA plus kids. Now, if you know the story of my family, we've been here with my daughter and there's so many things I wish I would have done differently all those years ago. If I could go back and teach myself sooner, gosh, you guys, I would. It matters so much to me to share what I learned. So I put together a really special me course for moms and dads and parents and guardians of LGBTQIA plus tweens and teens. But you guys, honestly, it's not just for parents. It's for anyone re-examining what they've been taught, for anyone asking new questions. It is for allies. It is for siblings and friends. And very seriously, it is for pastors and faith leaders and small group facilitators in your churches, right? Who would like a faithful path forward here. I've compiled everything you have ever asked me into this one e-course. And of course, I have two incredible guests. First is Sarah Cunningham, founder of Free Mom Hugs and the mom of a gay son who has so much lived wisdom. And she is just incredible in this course. We also have Isaac Archuleta, LPC. He is a licensed counselor and the founder of I Am Clinic, which is LGBTQ therapy. He specializes in the emotional and mental care of LGBTQIA plus kids and their families. And he brings so much expert advice. And plus, which he shares with us, has a really compelling personal story of his own that honestly, I can't wait for you to hear. It's super emotional. So if in any way you are interested in creating a kinder and safer world for our kids, because all kids are our kids, or if you feel alone, or lost and don't know what to do next, this is your course. You guys head over to mecourse.org, okay? That's mecourse.org to learn more and register. What's the primary pushback you get? Because I can I can intuit that women feel, I'm guessing, guilty, ashamed, like they're asking too much, um, mm-hmm. like they're being difficult. Um, because th- this goes against all the program when we've all been handed 100%. that our availability, our, um, easy nature, our constant yeses, never knows. It's just part of the contract. So I'm guessing that women feel guilty about this and men feel defensive. H- how does this start? And because to your point, it can be overcome both of those responses can be overcome. And there is a healthy path through here, but I can imagine there's some resistance here at the beginning. Do you experience that? Of course. And I'll tell you why. Because a lot of um, men uh, believe that 
there are these gender roles of like, I'm the breadwinner, the provider and the protector, and you handle everything else is mm-hmm. sort of, that has been sort of ingrained in us that sort of leave it to beaver model. Um, even though 60 to 70% of Americans are now in dual earner households. So we, we, you know, we sort of have to break that leave it to beaver dream because nuclear families are a complete joke. They gotcha. never existed. Uh, yeah. For all of time, we've been living in big communities um, of help. And so we've isolated ourselves to the point of depression. Um, And so there's so much pain in breaking, like I said, down these barriers. That's why it almost needs a trigger warning. Hmm. Um, But I'll read you this one. Yeah. Why do I think it's so important? And then I want to play a game with you. But I got this message on LinkedIn that made me feel very hopeful Hmm. Um, because I don't get as much pushback um, as you would think by men, I thought I would get a lot more, but, um, but I think when they understand that it's a system yeah. that there's a way to earn back time for what I call unicorn space, that people yeah. can have their own interests and lives. Uh-huh. But this one beautiful lawyer from Korea wrote me on LinkedIn. Um, it was just unbelievable. He said to me, dear Ms. Rodsky, this is a thank you message from Korea. I read your book, Fair Play Project. That's what it's called in Korean. And I write this message to express gratitude for you. I bought this book as one of husbands in the world. And I confess, I thought I'm a fairly good husband, but I was wrong. Okay, that's the defensiveness, right? Sure. Anger in the beginning part of Fair Play. So as one man said to me, I'm willing to accept your female anger because the system has been very helpful for me and my partner. I was like, okay, thank you for accepting my female anger. (laughs) Sure, thank you. I strongly believe everybody must read this book before they got married or have a baby. Personally, I lost my sister, who was a high court judge and a mother of two elementary student sons four years ago. It was because a cerebral hemorrhage stroke took her. I believe this disease exploded as she worked too hard and handled too much things during her father-in-law's death, which was just a week before her death. She took care of too many things as a full-time worker and a perfectionist judge. I think if this fair play project were spread all over the whole of Korea and every husband executes this project, my sister is still with us, having a balanced life with her smiling face, which I terribly, terribly miss. Wow. Thank you for writing this book. And I will practice this method from now on. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Honestly, the stakes are that high. Yeah. So if you have resistance because of all that guilt and defensiveness, as we talked about, you have to realize that the stakes are so high because you may not have a cerebral hemorrhage stroke. But if you believe that you're supposed to hold all the cards and have a life and work full time for pay and be in a dual ambition household, you're going to get physically sick. That's right. From the women from 10 years ago that we've been following, Jen, to today, they are sick. Mm -hmm. They are sick. They have hair loss. They have Hashimoto's disease. They have autoimmune issues. Um, They have thyroid problems. They have, um, we're we're tracking them. They have cancer diagnoses have um, SSRI use. Um, The the ones who aren't feeling sick are telling me that they're self-medicating through edibles to get through their weekends or at least two glasses of wine a night. We can't live like this anymore. So if I'm telling you, yes, there may be those things we have to fight through, but if you believe the stakes are high Mm -hmm. you're going to say you can be a change maker in your own relationship And that's why we're here. We're here to help you. We're here to say that this is not easy work. Don't do it all at once. Don't throw the cards at your partner and say, we have to do it today. But just sit with this. Listen to what Jen and I are saying today. Mm -hmm. And just listen. Think to yourself. Journal about it. What is hard for me to hear? What were the parts that really resonated? What feels hard? What feels scary about these messages? Mm -hmm. Because remember, I've been doing this for 10 years, and it's still a daily practice. Mm -hmm. This is not easy work. Mm -hmm. Let's do game. Let's do game. game. Okay. Yeah. So the biggest resistance that I have um, for myself when I was playing fair play mm-hmm. initially, and then for my early beta testers was there's no way my ownership, my ownership will look like my partner's ownership. Okay. That our minimum, I call it the minimum standard of care. People were calling it standards of care, that they're, that that the people were saying their standards were too high. Men were saying that about women. And women were saying their partner standards were way too low. And so how could you get people to agree on standards? I see. Uh-huh. That yeah. is, so the most important thing about the fair play system is not that you take a card because it matters more to you. 
Because mm. if you say that, then all women are going to have all the cards again. That's right. Because people say, you're doing all these unnecessary yeah. things. Yeah. That I don't need a balloon art thing. for their three-year-old party. That doesn't bother yep. me. So. That's right. Yeah. You're doing unnecessary things. That was the number one thing I heard from men. So we have to get through that. Mm -hmm. So the ownership mindset is not going to work until you as a couple really start exploring what matters to you, mm. your why, mm. what cards can come out of your deck? What doesn't matter to either of you? That's good. What matters more to you, but mm -hmm. you want your partner to do it at your standard because you don't always have to do the thing that matters more to you. So mm. what I will say, if you're not ready, there's some people who have amazing partners who they're so involved and engaged and they just want to make it, they want to tweak to make it easier. Sure. Those people go, you can go straight to the fair play system. Uh -huh. Your life will be easier in two weeks. I promise you those who have partners with more resistance as we're talking about who don't feel ready, who haven't communicated about domestic life before. This is where I want you to start. Your homework is, and you can find the cards online for free. You don't have to get them. They're at fairplaylife.com. But you pick one card and you just have a conversation with your partner over cookie dough, a glass of wine, whatever. On Valentine's Day, when your emotion is high, your, you know, your emotion is low, your cognition is high. Hmm. You start to have conversations about what matters to you in your home organization. Okay. So, Jen, I'll just practice with you, right? right. You're my partner. Okay. So I'm going to just, and you can do, it's a game. So yeah. I'm going to just shuffle all these cards. Okay. And then I'm going to stop at one. And then okay. and you tell me, just tell me, tell me when to stop. Okay, stop. Okay, let's see what this one is. Okay. Ooh, okay. Extended family. Mm. So what I want you to do with that card, it's a game. We just picked it out of uh, randomly out of the, okay. the deck. Okay. I want to know everything about your extended family when you grew up. Tell me what you remember. Did you know them? Did your part, your parents make an effort for you to get to know them? Mm. Do you have cousins? Do you have aunts? Did you take road trips to see anybody or were you not engaged with your extended family? Tell okay. me what you remember about extended family growing up. Okay. Um, only for my first three years of life. And then later again in high school, did we live by any extended family? So um, I don't remember those early years. Um, when we actually lived on my grandparents' farm, like in a little cool. shack <laughs> with my little farmer dad and the wife and the, me as the firstborn. Um, and so for all of my, the rest of my like preschool and elementary and middle school years, we lived kind of far away from family. And so we would travel. We didn't have a lot of money. We were like mm, lower middle class probably. And so our summer trips were driving back to Kansas where we'd stay at my <laughs> grandparents' house. Um, at or, the farm, at the farm, at, or they, well, had moved? They, they had a different house at that point, uh, but our okay. best trips were traveling in the summer to my grandparents' cabin in the Rocky mountains of Colorado. So that was our, that's the only vacation I ever took in my entire life. <laughs> like we never went anywhere else. I'd never been on an airplane until I was a grown up. Like we drove and, and we'd stay there for two or three weeks with my grandparents and their best friends and my parents' best friends would come, my cousins. And were there good memories? beautiful memories. Like if my siblings were here, we would sit here and talk about this for 10 hours. <laughs> so beautiful memories. But my, my, my extended family was not a daily or constant part of my life. It was more disconnected. But so, your parents made efforts to see them. Obviously. They, did. they They threw did. you on the car and That's they, right. That's did right. you have siblings? I did. I'm the oldest yeah. of four. And when I four. was coming into high school, we moved back to Kansas and then my parents lived back there where their parents were until uh, the end of their lives, really. So did and you so, have a relationship with your grandparents? Yes. So that's amazing. So for, first of all, I just want to let you know that took less than a minute. Okay. And I already feel like I know you exponentially better. Okay. Like, 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 I feel like we're best friends now. I mean, there's uh -huh. something really beautiful about hearing people's stories yeah. in a way that's like not psychologically oversharing the way Gen Z can sort of overshare. Sure. Um, and so not only that, but I can now predict how you may feel about extended family. I may, I may know that as you're my, you're my partner, that instead of us going to say, take a adventure trip to Iceland by ourselves, you may want to spend your precious, you know, vacation time visiting family or seeing your sister or visiting her kids. Mm -hmm. um, I may never have had any extended family. I grew up, I mean, I'm making this up now. I grew up as a yeah. thing, you know, as, as a, as, I'm married to you and I'm an only child and we didn't have any cousins. And mm. my, 
this is actually a true story for one of my friends, you know, her um, father was the middle and his older brother was abusive and he didn't never saw his sister. So she just found her new cousins on Facebook, but never saw them. So us together, why do you want to make such an effort to go see your sister? Like, I don't want to waste our time that way. Right. You start to get into uh-huh. the arguments about the thing. Yeah. When it's not about the thing, it's about understanding that I care about this because you, Jen, care about this. Mm. You can only get there if people understand why the minimum standard of care for you and extended family, that card would be maybe seeing your sister is once a year. Yeah. So the point is that we don't have, we do this in the workplace. We have many staff meetings and we check in about our responsibilities, but we don't have these deep and meaningful conversations yeah. about our home organization. Mm-hmm. So that's why I want people to, who, again, the ones who already have a great thing going on, they feel like they want to tweak the system. They can just fly into yeah. all the fair play tools for people who, as you said earlier, may have more resistance. I want them to start here. That's great. I love how you start with once like, a month. <laughs> just tell me, tell me about your history here. Tell me what this was like for you as a kid. This is so non-threatening. And that's fact, it. I just want, I really connected. want to know. Yeah. It's connective. It's me. I'm curious about you. I want to know more about you. Like talk to me about this. This is, that is a tool that would draw me to you, not push me away for sure. I love that and, beginning place. And it's important, especially if you've never communicated before when emotion is high and cognition is low like this, it's going to feel weird at first. Hmm. You're going to feel awkward with your partner sitting next to them. Or you're like, what are we doing here? And what do you mean? Like yeah. we know each, everything about each of other. Course but we don't. And so again, just like exercise, the first, after COVID, I hadn't taken one step in like 18 months. I remember feeling like I can't walk a half a mile last summer. That's how I felt Uh like right now I can get on a treadmill and walk a mile. Right. I mean, but a year ago I couldn't. Mm -hmm. Right. So people are not used to looking at communication as a practice. That's good. And in fact, in social media, I I surveyed a thousand people to ask their most important practice people would say some religious activity or meditation uh, or, um, or, or exercise. Yeah. But I, I was not surprised, but happy. I have the statistic now that over a thousand people did not, not one said communication would be there. I don't most think I would practice. say that. No, because again, though, we're not looking at it that way. Yeah. I'm not looking at it that way. You're right. But it is, it's a practice and we can get better and we can improve. So we I absolutely can improve. Yes, and so that's, that's right. why that's the last piece of that. That we started with boundaries, we went into system, and then you're a great interviewer because somehow naturally you just got us to communication, and we were able to sort of. I've never in actually one podcast addressed all three things as deeply mm. as this, mm. so I hope it wasn't too granular for no. your listeners. But we got very deep, and that is ultimately yeah. the boundary systems communication formula. It's that your time is diamonds stuff that we, that That's triggering right. almost we cried in the beginning of this. Yeah. The systems, which is that ownership piece and the minimum standard of care. But it all comes down to this practice of communication yeah. that you can start with, which is basically saying we've never checked in with each other. We don't yeah. talk to each other when emotion is low, cognition yeah. is high. Let's start this. And then again, if your partner's not used to this, use an anniversary or Valentine's yeah. Day or your birthday when a partner would be more generous and really use it to have to say, I mm-hmm. want to just do this game yeah. where we pick two cards out of a hat, out of the box or a hat or yeah. from online and just start telling each other our stories. That's so good. I'm 100% sure that everybody in my community that's listening right now wants more. 100% mm-hmm. sure. Because we just, oh, you know, we just scratch the surface here. Service, there's service. so much under it and there's so much this is incredible work, incredible content. And what a resource. I mean, this is, um, undoubtedly changing people's like marriages mm-hmm. and homes. Right. Thank I mean, you. Und- you must have like a deluge of, of positive input about how this has changed people's lives. I can only imagine yeah. for and both partners. This isn't just good for the women. This is good for the men too. And um, to be like active nurturing members of the family and, and good for the the kids to see both parents pulling with our oars. Like there's no downside. There's no downside. Literally, here. there's no downside. And in yeah. fact, if some if, if if you still don't believe me, you can Google the most watched TED Talk of all time. Just Google Robert Waldinger TED Talk. Hmm. It's the most watched TED Talk, most clicked on TED Talk of all time. It is a 75-year study over longevity of men. 
controlling mm-hmm. for every factor, whether it's yeah. smoking, age, yeah. weight, everything. What we know is that men are alive at 85 based on the quality of their relationships at 55. Yeah. You don't get quality, quality relationships without putting in the work. Yeah. These spaces in between those trips to Colorado, yeah. the, the work to go to get on that trip to Kansas, the, the noticing that your kid likes mustard, yeah. yellow kind, knowing the name of your child's dentist, they sound dumb and mundane and not important, but I'm telling you, your kids are watching. They are watching. They were watching your dynamics. They want you to be engaged out there. And so it's really a fun and beautiful um, proposition, as you said, that we can invite men into their full power in the home. There is really it. no downside. I love it. Will you just remind, tell my community, this is where they can find you. This is where these downloads are. This just all of it. Give the whole thing. Yes. Thank you. So the, um, at fair play life is our Instagram account. And we usually post a lot of research there. We have a newsletter called fair, um, the permission slip, um, all, these are all very research back things. So if you want to see like the latest studies or the newest tools we've developed, you can always sign up for our newsletter. Um, we want to make everything free for people so that people don't feel like they have to buy a book or get the cards. So all of our resources are online at fair play life. Dot com. You can go there. And then one, hopefully next year or in the fall, I can come back to discuss unicorn space yeah. because um, if you're wondering out there what you will do with yeah. all of your amazing free yeah. time now that you're living without decision yeah. fatigue in a system that, that th- our next, maybe Jen, you and I can do a 2.0 yeah. to just dis- to discuss what, um, what you will do with all that free time, which is, yep. Uh, the point that all the research I did um, for my second book. So you can also follow Unicorn Space Life. Uh-huh. That's really fun because it shows women in their full power of creativity. Uh, women like Jen here who um, are, you know, changing the world through um, asserting their own boundaries. It's It's mm-hmm. been really fun to, to follow you, Jen, and your journey and uh, and women like you. I 100% would love to have you come back yes. and quickly. And let's talk about find your unicorn space, which Yay. is like the next step, the most the beautiful next part. Like let's, let's now let's live. Let's so, live, let's yes. live and yes. dream yes. and, yes. and fantastic. keep to fill those dreams. That's and we'll right. talk all about that. Yes. Right. Talk about no downside. There's a huge upside here too. And we did hell. We didn't even get you. There's so much here. It's packed. So, Okay. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> on so today. Much for having I me. am just absolutely delighted to have met you. This was, I felt like time just evaporated. However long we've been talking, it just went into a vacuum. I just am hanging on your every word. This is the very last question. I actually ask everybody this question in every single series. And so you can answer this however you want. You can do it earnestly. <laughs> you can do it absurdly, whatever. How are you feeling today? Um, it's a question I borrowed from another teacher. Anyway, the question is, what is saving your life right now? Oh, I love I, that's such a great question. Yeah. Audiobooks in my car. Oh, what are you listening to? I mean, I would be doing them on the subway if I lived in New York still. Um, yeah. I have a car because I live in Los Angeles. Sure. So I, I read non I, I read my thrillers. I'm I'm I got the Christy freak. So I've read every single thriller that's ever come out in the past hundred at night. But during but during the day, I'm learning so much. Yeah. By listening to either business books and okay. and, and um, obviously you know your podcast, I was listening to it. Um, but but there's something about sort of interchanging between podcasts and then a, a book that makes you feel sort of yeah. deep dive, and then going back to yeah. uh, learning, and then a, another deep dive. And so um, audio books in my car, perfect. They're they're so random. Like I've done everything from "I'm Glad My Mom Died" by yeah. Janelle McCurdy. Uh-huh. Um, to Tiny Beautiful Things by Cheryl yeah. Strayed. That is great yeah. therapy. Um, right now I'm reading The Rise and Almost Fall of J. Crew. Um, and, and that's amazing because if you're if you're out there and you're an entrepreneur yeah. or a female founder, you can see how um, dangerous private equity can be sometimes um, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and sort of knowing what to look out for. Uh, and anyway, so that's great. Right. Saves- I literally can't, I'm addicted to audiobooks in my car. I love it so much. It's such a good use of time. <laughs> it's like reclaiming what would have felt like lost time. 
Um, 100, exactly. Yeah. And then coming out so much smarter. And then my kids get so annoyed at me. They're like, stop giving us a lesson. I'm like, well, you're, <laughs> totally. don't you want to know what I learned? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, I'm very serious. Look for an email about coming back yes, and let's yes. talk more. Let's like, let's bring this conversation into its next phase, which is find your unicorn space. Um, Yay. and we'll link to all of this for everybody. So, and post some gonna... pictures of your road trips. Cause I want to see you as a kid in your, in your car. Oh my gosh. I will show you some pictures yes, of me yes, in yes. Colorado in the seventies and eighties. Oh my gosh. My grandma so had cute. orange shag carpet. I mean, it was <laughs> lit, absolutely lit. Oh my so, God. So happy to meet you. You too. Until Talk next to you soon. time. Thank all you. Right, until next time. Bye. All right, you guys, just, I told you, like, well, it's not that often I have a conversation where I feel uniquely seen in an area that I have previously felt profoundly lonely in. Does that make sense? Like, this conversation is just not happening enough, but it's so real. It's so real. So, Okay. As promised, if you go to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, I will have this episode. This is a great one to share. You guys give this to your young adult daughters. Give these to, give these to your younger colleagues that you work with. Give them to your sisters. This is a conversation we're sharing. And then I will have all these links. I mean, Eve said it, a bunch of this stuff is free. You can just go to the site and download it. This, these are some free tools to use. And so I will link to her books, her site, the cards, all of it over at jenhatmaker.com plus her socials. So, um, I am looking forward already to having round two of this conversation with her. What a bright and shining star in the world. So I hope this served you well. I hope you felt seen and heard today, um, in a place that historically has been invisible. Ooh, this is a great series and I love it so much. All right, you guys see you next week.